Hello, and welcome to St. Elizabeth Healthcare's preoperative education class for total shoulder replacement. My name is Karen Rasso, and I'm the assistant nurse manager of the inpatient spine and orthopedic unit here at St. Elizabeth Florence. I'm very excited to be able to bring you this education virtually since we have not been able to gather together at this time. Getting started, let's talk about your partner in care. So what is a partner in care? Your partner in care is your cheerleader. Your partner in care is your go-to person that's gonna help prepare you for surgery, um, be with you during surgery, and then help you once you get home from surgery to make sure you have the best outcomes possible. Before surgery, you will be coming in for pre-admission testing. They'll be doing different types of blood work, um, and you'll also be able to meet with someone from the anesthesia department. During this time, they'll talk to you about what medications to continue taking, what medications to stop taking, and when to stop taking them. Things to bring with you to the hospital, an updated current list of your home medications, as well as any medication or food allergies. Also, any living will or power of attorney paperwork that you can have, bring us a copy of that in, that way we can have an updated copy on file. Any bracelets or paperwork that the pre-admission testing um, gave to you, definitely bring those back with you when you come. And then any clothing or hygiene items, that would make you more comfortable during your stay, pack those along with you. We have everything you could possibly need. You're going to be in a hospital gown, um, non-skid socks. We have toothbrush, toothbrush, toothpaste, things like that. Um, but anything that you feel like might make you more comfortable, feel free to bring it. From the time that you have your pre-admission testing to the time that you come in day of surgery, please make sure if anything changes in your health condition, you know, if you catch a cold, if you have a respiratory virus, let the surgeon or somebody from the medical team know. That way we can just ensure that we're operating on you um, when you're at optimal health so that you can have the best outcomes possible. Day of surgery do's and don'ts. Do wear your hearing aids or any glasses that you might need to read or to communicate with the surgical team. Um, you know, last minute conversations, questions that you might have, um, forms you might need to fill out or sign. We just wanna make sure that you're able to see those um, and able to understand those properly. Make sure that you arrive at the time you're instructed by the doctor's office, but be prepared that that time can be flexible depending on what's going on that day. You know, if the surgery before you possibly gets delayed or if the surgery before you gets canceled, you could be moved up or moved back. Have a family member with you, or not necessarily a family member, but whoever your partner in care is. Um, this person will be with you through the whole intake process. And when you're ready to go to surgery, they will be asked to go wait in their vehicle, but don't worry, the surgeon will call them and give them an update and let them know how everything went. Don't eat or drink past midnight. Don't swallow the water while you're brushing your teeth. Don't use alcohol or tobacco products for at least 24 hours before surgery, the longer the better. No gums, mints, or hard candies the day of surgery. People think this is harmless because they, you know, you're not technically eating anything. But when you're sucking on a mint or chewing on a candy, um, you do produce more saliva and that ends up in your stomach. And our goal is to keep your stomach as empty as possible for surgery. Last but not least, don't wear any jewelry, fingernail or toenail polish, acrylic nails or makeup on the day of surgery. We want to be able to just at a glance look and see how you're doing, see what your color looks like. When you arrive at same day surgery, the nurse will collect any paperwork that you brought with you. They'll go ahead and they'll put you in a hospital gown and they'll place an IV. They'll talk to you about your medical history, your medications, start that admission process. Your partner and care will be able to be with you this entire time. When you're all checked in and ready to go, they will bring you over to the holding area. Now the holding area is where you're going to have the opportunity to not only see your physician, but also the anesthesiologist. Um, you will be able to ask any questions that you might've thought of since the last time you saw them. And 
your surgeon will do what's called marking the operative site. He's actually going to um, take a marker and put his initials um, on the extremity that you and he are both in agreement that you're having an operation on. Once all of this is taken care of, you can go ahead and get some medicine to help you relax. If your surgeon has ordered a nerve block to do um, a block on your arm, then they'll go ahead and they'll give you this nerve block prior to surgery. So your arm is going to be numb before you even go under. You'll have the opportunity to ask any more questions that you might think of. And then at this point, your family is going to be asked to return to their vehicle until surgery is complete. Now let's talk about the two different types of shoulder replacements that you can have. On the left side of your screen is a picture of a total shoulder arthroplasty. So in this picture, you see that you have your ball and socket joint. And anatomically, it is the exact same way as how we were born. Your ball is on the end of your humerus and your socket is over next to your clavicle scapula area. So it's your ball and socket joint, um, but of course the surgeon will cut off the head of the humerus and implant a ball and then also implant a new socket. So you'll have totally new hardware in there. On the right side of your screen, this is a picture of a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So it's still a total shoulder joint and the surgeon is still replacing all of the mechanisms of that ball and socket joint. However, he's done everything reversed. You're still gonna be cutting off the head of the humerus, but here you're going to be making a socket and the ball is gonna be implanted over on your clavicle scapula area. So again, like I said, still a ball and socket joint, just reversed. Now, your surgeon will talk to you about which way is gonna be best for you. During um, assessments and MRIs and different imaging, they've more than likely assessed what your rotator cuff looks like. And anyone who has a poor rotator cuff normally is going to have the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. The reason for that is because if you do not have a properly working rotator cuff, your surgeon can do a perfect total shoulder replacement on you, the, the image on the left side there, and you're still not gonna have that range of motion. You're still not gonna be able to lift your arm and do the things that you really wanna do with your new shoulder. So once the surgeon has worked his magic um, and you have your brand new shoulder prosthesis in, um, they'll take you to what we call the PACU um, or the post anesthesia care unit. During this time, you're still gonna be pretty drowsy. Um, you'll be starting to wake up from surgery. This is when the surgeon's gonna have the opportunity to call your partner in care and let them know how everything went. The nurses um, in the PACU are going to be monitoring you really, really closely. You'll still probably have blood pressure cuff on. You'll still probably have electrodes on your chest uh, monitoring your heart. Once you start waking up a little bit, you can start taking some ice chips or some sips of water if you feel up to it. And if you're having any pain or any discomfort, nausea, anything like that, you just let them know and they'll go ahead and give you some pain medicine as needed. When you're a little bit more awake, when all your vitals are stable, that's when you'll move to the inpatient spine and orthopedic unit. Now, normally patients come to us on the inpatient spine and orthopedic unit and spend the night with us. Uh, most of our patients go home the next day. We have all private rooms. We're a 15 bed unit. We have flat screen televisions and wireless internet. Culinary Creations is what we call our room service. So they're open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And you can just order, um, you know, whatever you feel like eating, whenever you feel like it. If it is during visiting hours, guest trays are available for purchase. And currently our visiting hours are 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Two visitors are allowed to come per day and they are able to come and go. So re-entry is granted at this time. Some of the staff that you're going to be seeing while you're here with us at St. Elizabeth is, of course, your nurse and your nursing assistant. You'll have somebody assigned to you 24-7. In addition to that, you'll see a manager, assistant nurse manager, or a charge nurse, just someone from the leadership team coming in to check in on you, just see how everything's going. Someone from your surgeon's team, um, either your surgeon themselves um, or also maybe probably a nurse practitioner, 
And then you'll be seeing our physical therapists and our occupational therapists, as well as our care coordination department. Now, one thing that we take really, really seriously here at St. Elizabeth is safety. So, you know, after surgery, I know normally, you know, you're probably very independent at home, getting up, moving around on your own. But after surgery, between the anesthesia that you've had, the pain medicine that you've had, the fact that one of your arms is now going to be in a sling, and the other arm is probably going to be hooked up to an IV pole, there's lots of reasons that we want you to call us before you get up for any reason. We just want to make sure sure whether it's going to the bathroom, getting up to the chair, or going for a walk down the hallway, that you're safe. Let's talk about some of the orthopedic equipment that you are probably going to see while you're here with us. So first is your sling. Um, the picture on the left hand side of your screen there is what the slings traditionally look like right now. Um, as long as you do not have a posterior approach. This is Dr. Griley's um, newer approach where he actually goes in from the back of the shoulder. Um, and you will know if, if you're a candidate for this and you will know if this is the approach you're having. As long as you're not having that approach, then you will be getting one of these nice black slings um, from OrthoSensi. Make sure you call the office and you plan and schedule out um, how and when to pick that up because you'll need to bring that with you on the day of surgery. Next on our list is a urinary catheter. Now, shoulder replacement does not take very long. Um, so mostly shoulder replacement patients do not get a catheter during surgery. The only time you're going to see a catheter is if after surgery, the anesthesia makes it difficult for you to urinate, which does happen sometimes for people. Um, if it makes it difficult for you to urinate and your bladder is filling up and you're not able to, to pee, um, then we're going to do what's called a straight cath. And that's just to drain the bladder to make you more comfortable. Um, as the anesthesia wears off, normally you will not require a catheterization more than once, maybe twice. Um, and then as the anesthesia gets out of your system, you're able to go on your own before you go home. The next thing on our list is an incentive spirometer, or also called an IS. That's the picture on the right side of your screen. If you've had surgery before, you might recognize this. This is a little breathing tool or toy or exercise that we use to help inflate your lungs after surgery and help prevent complications like pneumonia. Next is a thrombic boots or TED hose. So a thrombic boots is the pumps that we put on your calves um, while you're in the hospital. And every couple minutes, they pump up and they squeeze your calves and help circulate your blood through, through your body. The TED hose are those compression stockings that sometimes surgeons or doctors order for their patients to wear while they're in the hospital or maybe around the house while you're not um, up and moving as much as normal. Both of these help prevent blood clots. So they're really, really important to use. Next is cold therapy. Now, the orthopedic office does normally offer some out-of-pocket um, cost cold therapy options. Um, this is things that you can get from OrthoSensi's office, one of which, one of the more popular ones is called a polar pack. It's like a igloo cooler and you put ice water in it and then the ice water circulates through a hose and then up into a pad that you can lay over your shoulder. It's a wonderful cooling device and the surgeons just rave over them. Um, however, like I said, this is an out-of-pocket cost. This is normally not covered by your insurance company. So even if this is not good for you, if, if you're not going to choose to purchase that, um, we still have ice packs um, at St. Elizabeth on our unit, and we will ice down your shoulder no matter what. So if you do choose to bring something in and purchase something, that's great. Bring it with you when you come. We'll utilize your device. Otherwise, we'll keep your shoulder iced down either way. Last but not least is dressings. So when you first come out of surgery, you're going to have a really big bulky dressing on your shoulder. And some people look at it and get really nervous about, you know, oh my goodness, how big is my incision? 
the dressing that they put on your shoulder after surgery is just meant to be large and bulky, you know, to absorb any possible drainage that you might have overnight, you know, that first night after surgery. The next day, we take all of that down and we put on a much smaller, simpler dressing of just some gauze and tape. So don't be alarmed at the dressing you see when you first wake up. Next, let's talk about assistive devices. So physical therapy is going to come and work with you. They're going to get you up, get you moving, and they're going to assess what kind of mobility needs you might have. They want to make sure that you're safe. They want to make sure that you're steady. So if you know, you're know you safer or more steady walking with a cane or walking with a hemi walker, they're going to make those recommendations. If you have any stairs at home, we do want to practice on stairs before you leave us. And if you have more than two consecutive steps, we recommend having a handrail. So go ahead and start looking around your house now and seeing what um, sort of safety interventions you could put in place before surgery. Now let's talk about medication. So pain medicine is going to be very, very important after surgery. The shoulder blocks that we use are wonderful um, and they're so helpful when it comes to pain control after such a big surgery. The only thing about shoulder blocks is that we never know exactly when they're gonna wear off or how quickly they're going to wear off. So we wanna make sure that we're constantly assessing what can you feel, how can you feel it, and are you in any pain? We wanna go ahead and get you started on some pain medicine before you're hurting too bad. That way we can always stay on top of the pain. So our goal is to give pain medicine at regular intervals. We don't wanna let your pain get out of control um, because once it's out of control, it's really, really hard to get it back under control again. We want to make sure your pain is nice and under control for physical therapy. That way you can participate with them um, and they can really assess how well you can do instead of only seeing somebody who's, you know, really hurting and really struggling from pain. You have to ask for your pain medicine. So pain medicine is always ordered as needed which means this isn't something that your nurse is going to just automatically bring in and administer. Please talk to your nurse. And if you're starting to have discomfort, let them know and we can look and see what's available and what we can administer. There's two different types of pain medicine that we administer after surgery. The first is gonna be pain pills. That's always gonna be our first line of defense. However, if the pain pills don't work, if they just kind of don't do the trick and you're not quite comfortable, let us know. Then we can give you IV pain medicine. The IV pain medicine is something that we do sometimes have to utilize that first evening, that first night after surgery. Now our goal is the next day after surgery, the day that you'll probably be going home. If you have been needing the pain medicine that's through your IV, we'll kind of start backing off on that weaning you off of that because we want to make sure that your pain is going to be under control um, with just the pain pills by themselves since that's what you're going to be going home with. Now every medication has potential side effects. Um, it's really important to understand what potential side effects are so your nurse is going to be talking with you about that um, and you know letting you know of things to look at. Avoiding complications. So there are some complications um, from any sort of surgery. So we wanna talk about these, that way we can talk about the things and the preventative measures that we put in place to help prevent these complications after surgery. The first one we're gonna to discuss today is pneumonia. Now pneumonia can be a complication after any surgery, not just shoulder surgery. During surgery, you know, you do have a breathing tube down your throat and your lungs natural reaction is to produce some phlegm because there's been, there's been an invader. There's been something there, a foreign substance, a foreign body there that it doesn't really recognize. So things that we can do to help prevent pneumonia after surgery is to cough and deep breathe. Um, these exercises are good approximately every two hours. This is another thing that the incentive spirometer is really, really good for. So that incentive spirometer, you're gonna breathe in deep, suck in like you're sucking in a straw. Because if the thought is you wanna inflate your lungs, you want your lungs to be big and full of air to help prevent pneumonia. 
early mobility, getting up and getting moving is the best thing you can do for your lungs after surgery, as well as oral care, mouth care twice a day, whether it's brushing your teeth, rinsing your mouth out, and then also moving around and changing positions helps as well. Blood clots. So blood clots, again, this is a potential complication of any surgery, not just shoulder surgery. Some of the signs and symptoms of blood clots are going to be redness, swelling, heat, and pain. This doesn't necessarily have to be in your calf. It could potentially be in any extremity. To help prevent blood clots, things we're going to do is potentially use blood thinners. If you're not already on some sort of a blood thinner or an anticoagulant, a lot of times the shoulder surgeons are going to prescribe an aspirin after surgery, not only while you're here at the hospital, but also for when you go home. So the morning after surgery, when your nurse is giving you, you know, your morning medications, um, if there's an aspirin in there, you know, don't be alarmed. It's just one of the things that we do to help prevent blood clots after surgery. This is another reason why those compression boots or those athrombic boots are so important to keep on your calves while you're laying in bed. And then also frequent ankle pumps. So ankle pumps are exactly like what they sound like. You're going to push your toes down like you're pushing on a gas pedal, and then you're going to bring your toes back up towards, towards your body, towards the sky. As silly as it sounds, something as simple and as easy as that helps increase your blood flow and helps prevent blood clots. Now, if at any point in time, um, while you're in the hospital, of course, you would want to notify your nurse, but if you're at home and you experience chest pain or shortness of breath, this can potentially be a sign that a blood clot has dislodged. If a blood clot dislodges and it goes to your heart, your lungs, or your brain, that is a medical emergency, so you would want to call 911 immediately. The next thing I wanna to talk to you about is infections. So obviously during um, surgery, everything is a sterile environment. So that very first initial dressing that you have on your shoulder, everything under there is completely sterile. Nursing is gonna change that dressing for you before you go home and we're gonna use a really good clean technique. But once you go home, we're relying on you to help prevent infection until that incision heals. So things you can do, wash your hands or have whoever's helping you, your partner in care, wash their hands really good before touching your dressing or your incision. Do not apply any lotions, creams, powders, or medicines to your incision unless it's approved by your doctor. Most of the time I will tell you the surgeons just want you to keep your incision clean and dry. Don't bathe or soak in any bodies of water. That's tubs, lakes, pools, anything until approved by the physician. Because we want to make sure that your incision is nice and healed on the outside before you're submerged in water. And then keep your incision covered by clothing. Normal signs and symptoms of infection. Redness, swelling, warmth, and joint pain. Fever over 101 degrees foul odor, or a drainage that is yellow or green in color. Any of this is going to be reasons why you would want to call your surgeon and possibly be looked at. Skin issues. So this is something that people don't think of a lot, but skin breakdown is something that can happen after surgery because you know, you're not as mobile in the bed as you, as you normally are. Um, you're sitting still, you know, not feeling great, probably has taken some pain medicine, things like that. So in order to prevent skin breakdown while you're at the hospital or while you're at home, try and keep your heels off the bed. Um, while you're at the hospital, we try and put a pillow under your calves so that your heels aren't quite laying on the bed. Let your nurse know if you're sitting or lying on um, sheets that you feel like are wrinkled or maybe they're damp from where you've been sweating. Let us know and we'll get you a, a new bed change. We try and turn our patients about every two hours. Now, if you're in bed and you're moving around all over the place, then you might not need to be turned. But if we check on you and then we check on you a couple hours later and realize you've been sitting in the same position for a while, we might ask if we can help you reposition. The next thing is gonna be the sling. So that sling is a wonderful thing and it's there for a reason to protect your arm. But once you get home, you also do wanna make sure that you're inspecting your skin under the sling and making sure you're not getting any redness or breakdown. The most common area for this is going to be around your neck where that neck strap rests. Drainage. After surgery, there is going to be a normal 
type of drainage and a normal amount of drainage. Some people don't have any drainage. Some people do have a little bit. If it's clear or if it's blood tinged in small amounts, then it's perfectly normal. What we're gonna be wanting you to notify your surgeon about is any fresh bleeding, large amounts of drainage, anything that's green, yellow, or purulent in color, and anything that has a foul odor. Constipation. Um, not everybody likes to talk about this, but it's something that happens really, really commonly after surgery, especially orthopedic surgeries, because you do tend to be on pain medicine, which can constipate you as well. So between the pain medicine that you're on after surgery and the anesthesia, which has put your entire body, bowels included, to sleep during surgery, sometimes things are just sluggish. So it's something that we wanna prevent. Um, after surgery, we go ahead and get you started on a stool softener. We want you to continue taking that stool softener every single day until you're completely off the pain medicine. If you get home and you realize, you know, you haven't had a bowel movement in three days or so, you might want to contact your doctor because you might want to get direction on something stronger to take to get your bowels moving. The wonderful thing about Orthosensi is that they have um, after hours clinic, this urgent care clinic location. So it's at their location over at Edgewood and they're open Monday through Friday until 9 p.m. And they even have Saturday hours. So Saturday they're open from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, Walk-ins are welcome or you can just call the 301 bone number just like you normally would be if you were calling Orthosensi um, to see if you, know, you need to schedule an appointment or if you can be seen. So let's talk about discharge. Everybody's favorite thing, discharging and going home from the hospital. The doctor normally comes in the day after surgery. You know, he's gonna do his assessment, make sure you're doing well, um, let you know how surgery went, because this might be the first time that you've really talked to him after surgery. And then they're gonna let you know that, you know, as soon as you check mark all those boxes, you'll be able to go home that day. We have to make sure that your discharge is a safe one. So not only are we gonna make sure that your pain's under control, on oral pain medicine by itself, you're eating and drinking okay, and you need to be able to urinate, you need to be able to pee. You do not have to have a bowel movement before you go home. So once all those boxes are checkmarked, then we're definitely on our way. The physical therapist is gonna come and work with you, teach you, you know, what precautions, um, you know, what things you can do, what things you can't do, um, and what you need to be careful of. You're also probably going to be seen by an occupational therapist, as well as somebody from our care coordination department. And that's just to make sure that you have everything you need to go home and be successful after your joint replacement. At discharge or shortly after discharge, we can send it to you in the mail. Um, you will be getting this total joint replacement card. This is a wallet card um, that you can keep with you. And if at any point in time you are, you know, going through an airport, metal detectors, x-ray machines, and anybody ever questions you about the hardware that you have in your shoulder, this is something with your name, your surgeon's name, the date you had your procedure, so that you can pull it out and show them, you know, this is what you're seeing, this is what it is. Um, and it's, it's a prosthetic joint. If you think of any questions regarding, you know, the surgery itself, definitely be your own advocate and call your surgeon's office and get those questions answered. If you think of any questions regarding your hospital stay or maybe what our current practices and protocols are right now, feel free to call our unit. So the spine and orthopedic unit at Florence, the telephone number is 212 5700. Now let's talk about physical therapy and occupational therapy for a little bit. Some of the main questions that our therapists get, when will my pain go away? So the good news is that the arthritic pain that you had before, the deep aching pain, that pain is going to be gone. Unfortunately, you are going to have new pain. You're going to have a surgical pain. But the good thing about surgical pain is that it goes away. It gets better and better every single day until it's gone. Some stiffness can be expected following total shoulder replacement, but between therapy and ice and different therapies like that, that'll work its way out and that'll improve. 
Will I need an assistive device after surgery? You're gonna be up, you're gonna be walking the day of surgery. At first, you're not gonna be able to use your, your prosthetic arm. Um, that's gonna be in a sling, that's gonna be immobilized. Your therapists are gonna work with you and assess whether or not you're gonna need a cane or a hemi walker or something like that. If you're steady on your feet and if you're safe walking, then you won't necessarily need any sort of assistive devices other than the sling to protect your new shoulder. Can I hurt my shoulder? Don't use your shoulder immediately following surgery, okay? It's gonna be in the sling, it's going to need to be protected. You're not allowed to do any weight bearing on that shoulder. So weight bearing, what does that mean? Weight bearing is actually putting any weight through that shoulder. So you're allowed to move your fingers, you're allowed to pump your fist, you're allowed to flex your wrist. That's all perfectly fine. Um, it actually is, is recommended because it helps any swelling that you have in your fingers but you're not actually allowed to use your operative arm to pick something up or carry something until your doctor um, increases your weight bearing status. Make sure you follow all shoulder precautions and we'll talk to you about that a little bit more. You know, after surgery, um, there's a booklet that you'll get that also discuss your shoulder precautions. In that book that I was talking about, um, it is our Total Shoulder Replacement Patient Education book. Um, you can get that in pre-admission testing, um, or it's also um, available on our internet site. There is a document in there called Timeline for Recovery, and it's a section of the book that really helps give you a general guideline for when you're going to be able to do certain activities. When will I go home? So before you get to go home, there's going to be some things that we need to make sure you can do safely. Getting in and out of a chair or bed by yourself. Walking independently, whether with or without an assistive device. Just because you need an assistive device doesn't necessarily disqualify you from going home. We just want to make sure you're safe and you're steady on your feet. Being able to get on and off the toilet safely and show an understanding of your exercise programs and your precautions. Exercises. So the therapists are going to be teaching you a couple different exercises before you go home. Um, and it's important that you do these on a regular basis. Some of these exercises, the ones that you do until you follow up with your surgeon and actually get released to go to physical therapy. Um, the exercises that we give you in the hospital to do for that short period is just really gonna keep you from getting stiff. So we're talking range of motion of the hand, range of motion of the elbow. So make sure you're doing that on a regular regular basis. At first, your therapist is going to assist you. They're going to walk you through it, but you'll need to be able to do them independently. This is a great time for your coach or your partner in care to step in and help you out because they'll be able to make sure you're doing them correctly um, and be an extra set of eyes, an extra set of ears whenever the therapists are explaining the activities for you. If any exercise or activity causes an unusual amount of pain, please, please stop and make sure you discuss it with your therapist and or your surgeon just to make sure that there's nothing that we should be concerned of. Recovery tips after surgery. So physical therapy, depending on the time that you get back to your room after surgery, they might be with you that same day or more than likely they'll see you the next morning. Make sure you're communicating with your nurses on keeping your pain under control because we wanna get you up, we wanna get you moving um, at least out of bed two to three times a day so that we can get you active and get you going again. Another reminder to please do not get up by yourself. Call us and we will come and help you with whatever it is that you need. Change position, cough, take deep breaths at least every two hours while you're in bed, and make sure you're doing those wrist and hand pumps frequently throughout the day. Going home. So once you are ready to go home, make sure that the person who comes and picks you up brings a mid-sized vehicle. Anything that's too low is somewhat different, difficult to get in and out of. Additionally, something that's really, really big is kind of hard to climb in and out of. Um, we'll assist you getting in and out of any vehicle that you bring, but something mid-size is gonna be a lot better for you.
If you have any specific concerns about getting in or out of your vehicle, definitely write those down and ask physical therapy prior to discharge. If the therapist recommends that you walk with a cane or a hemi walker, then our care coordination team will help you know where you can get one of those um, so that you can safely mobilize at home. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a bit, but just make sure you plan in advance for a safe environment once you get home. Bathrooms are common places for accidents, so you really need to be aware of any slippery surfaces, any you know, water on the floor, things like that. So going home, some general safety tips. You're potentially going to need assistance for five to seven days after you go home. This is because you're one arm down. You're going to be doing everything one-handed. Um, so it, it makes things like going to the bathroom, getting cleaned up, taking a shower, even fixing food, it makes it a little bit more difficult. In addition to that, you're going to be on pain medicine for the first little bit as well. So just try and plan on having assistance for the first five to seven days once you go home after surgery. Never increase your weight bearing status unless your physician or your therapist tell you to do so. So again, you should not be using that operative arm for anything um, other than just, you know, moving your hand, moving your fingers. You could probably hold a remote in that hand and, you know, click the buttons on the remote, but not actually picking anything up, lifting anything with that arm. Make sure at home you have good lighting. Adhere to all your shoulder precautions. Be mindful of pets. This is one of my favorite ones because I am an animal lover. I know that when you get home from the hospital, your pets are going to be so excited to see you. I highly recommend have someone go into the house first, put your pets in another room, shut the door, allow yourself time to get in, get seated and get comfortable. Once you're in and you're sitting down, then the pets can be let out to come and welcome you and greet you. I'm sure they're going to have missed you. They're going to be wanting to give you all sorts of love, but we just need to make sure it's safe. Otherwise, they're going to get under your feet and we just want to do everything possible to prevent a fall. Avoid low chairs because low chairs are really hard to get in and out of. Bathroom safety, which we've talked about before, making sure there's no water on the floor. Possibly, um, you know, do you need any grab bars in the bathroom? Do you need a toilet seat riser? Do you need a shower chair? Avoid loose flooring and remove throw rugs. Anything that you could potentially get snagged up on. Make sure you have unobstructed paths. And then keep needed items close. So, you know, if you're going to be sitting in the chair watching a movie for an hour or two, go ahead and make sure that you have your incentive spirometer next to you, you have a drink next to you, you have your remote control next to you. Um, that way you don't have to get up and go grab these things. One of the therapist's responsibilities um, is to make sure that the patient is safe and they have a safe di discharge plan. So this means that they're evaluating you and making sure, you know, are you safe to go home or do you need a little bit more therapy before you go home? Some of the different options at discharge that our therapists could possibly recommend is home with home health to come and work with you and get you stronger home with outpatient therapy, and this could be, you know, you going and, you know, doing a little bit of therapy outside of the house, a short stay in an extended care facility, and this is like a skilled nursing facility, or a more intensive therapy at like a rehab hospital. So those last two options, the skilled um, nursing facilities and the rehab hospitals, those are going to be inpatient programs somewhere where you would go once you left the hospital to get stronger before you went home. So these are all options. Normally with shoulders, if you're walking well beforehand, if you're walking well before surgery, you're not gonna have a problem after surgery. But there are times where people need a little bit more therapy after shoulder surgery. Our care coordinators in our social work, they're an absolutely amazing team. So don't worry about if therapy gives you any recommendations. That is where our care coordination team swoops in. They will let you know, um, you know, with your insurance, what places are approved, what are our options, and what are our next steps. They will make all those telephone calls for you, um, and they will really give you the insight um, of what you need to do. 
if you have any questions regarding care coordination um, or coverage, you can call our care coordination department and that's the 301-2275 number. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. If you have any questions at all, we do have an email address. It is askortho at stelizabeth.com. We check that frequently, so please feel free to shoot us an email and we will get back to you as soon as possible.